Okay, to start off with, my name's Yomi Ayeni. I am the creative lead for what I call um, a nice little creative lab in London called Articipate. We specialize in um, making interactive concepts and content for various festivals, live events, feature films, but also one of my key areas of interest is participatory media, where we create content that will hopefully live in people's hearts and people's minds. Um, one of the ways that we do that is by introducing people to narratives, and it was an app I downloaded this morning. So, there. One of the things that we do is we create content and participatory experiences where we invite people to come in and take control of situations. What I'm about to do um, this morning, or still morning, is take you through the process um, through which um, we've created our latest concept, and it's called Clockwork Watch. Um, this is how you can get hold of me, and I'm sure you're going to have quite a few questions after this. Um, if you, because we're slightly tight for time, if you have anything in between that you want to ask, please give me a yell, and you'll be able to contact me later on. Anyway, um, distractions. As I said, this is a process through which I've used to design um, Clockwork, and Clockwork is a five-year-long story that is being told across various platforms. One of the key things about Clockwork Watch is the fact that it's a participatory, co-created story. Unlike a lot of other films where you ask people to step into your make-believe, step into a dark room for 90 minutes and watch a narrative, Clockwork comes in five distinct parts. The first part is interacting with the audience, seeding a story through the audience, and then asking the audience to build the world in which we tell, the, that we, in which we set the film in. So it's a co-created, collaborative sort of process, and the object of the exercise, to a certain degree, is to free the storyteller in everybody. A lot of what I do is experiential, it's experimental, it's never been done before, not in this way. And owing to the fact that I pay for most of my own stuff and the public support me, it gives me the opportunity and the privilege to push boundaries further than anyone will ever allow. Anyone giving you money to make the film, that is. So, <clears throat> the world that we live in is full of distractions. It's one of these things that we've more or less become accustomed to. You know, everything we do, be it at work, at home, walking down the street, you've got billboards, you've got your mobile phone, you've got your iPod, you've got people handing you flyers, you've got things jumping out at you, even when you're online, going through your news, you know, your, your news groups or your email, you've got adverts, each thing is trying to get your attention. And the funny thing is, we love it. We actually embrace it. We buy all these mobile devices because they enhance our lives. They give us the opportunity to connect with the world, to feel alive. Um, but an untethered universe, an untethered world, where you're not particularly sitting in front of a desk all the time, but you can carry that content with you all the time and you can interact with it, quite a daunting task, especially as you know this content that we have is distributed. It's not as if, you know, the old days where you would sit at home and you'd watch a television program and you'd have to put in your VHS recorder to record it if you needed to go out. Well, that is gone. Now, you can watch part of the TV at home. You can watch the rest of it on your mobile phone. You can actually call up things like the BBC iPlayer when you get to work and rehash what you've already seen. And those distractions fracture our attention span. They don't, not so much say we have a short attention span, but the lives that we live don't actually give us the opportunity to actually break or focus on one thing for such a long time. It's a bit similar to this. You know, I don't have a short attention span, I just, oh, cheeseburger. And this is one of the, the beauty, beauties of, of, of the whole thing. We are distracted. It's, it's kind of like me. I have a weird affinity for red. Anyone wearing anything red, no matter what I'm paying attention to, when I see that bright red, it catch, takes my mind away, just like that. And in a world where people are putting millions of pounds into making films, how the hell do you expect people to pay attention to what you're trying to show them? You know, subplots, all the rest of the stuff, all become a thing of the past. You know, you've probably heard a lot about statistics in the past day. Um, cinema attendance, finance, copyright, IP. 
Well, all of these things fall, almost fall, outside the scope. What I do falls outside the scope of all of that. There are no ground rules to what I do. We make it up as we go. Anyone who stands in front of you and says they're an expert in making transmedia is telling a lie. It's an emerging process. It is in your hands. You are the creators of transmedia because people are trying to adapt to how you live your lives. And that is one of the key things. With me, one of the fundamental objectives is create mindshare, legacy, and buzz. I want you to think about what I create. I want you to love it. I don't want you to wear the T-shirt, because that does me no favors, and I, I'm not particularly fond of wearing T-shirts with names and badges on them. But I want to claim some real estate in your mind. Hence, the color red. I don't know what it reminds me of, other than each time I see it, it gets my attention. When I do stories and I create stories, I want you, be it walking down the street and you see something and for that fraction of a second, you step back into my world because you remember something that I have told you, something you have experienced, something that you have learned, something you've interacted with. And that is how I build my stories. It's very, very intuitive to a certain degree, but mind space, a fraction of your mind, buzz, you tell people about it because it is of some relevance to them. You share it through social media and all the rest of it. And legacy, the sheer fact that you remember it enough that it takes hold of your memory every once in a while. So there we are, surrounded by just about everything. You know, you've got Wikipedia, if you want to find out something that's you know, past history, even though that's co-created by the public as well. You've got your mobile device. You know, you can jack up uh, Google or anything. I mean, the days when you had to run to the library or had to get an encyclopedia in person have long gone. We're connected in every possible way. We love the immediacy. You know, who wants to be the last person to watch someone's video? You know, the moment it hits your mailbox or someone tells you about it, be it a trend or something like that, you run to your device, whatever it is. And then you want to share it with the world. You want to share it with people. The sheer fact that we're mobile now means, you know, yeah, you can share it instantly. But in true honesty, at some point, whereas I come from a generation where I remember what a phone used to be like when it was tethered to the wall, in a few generations' time, the concept of having a handheld mobile phone will probably disappear. It will be something totally different. The world evolves. Technology evolves. And... As I put it, it's leading us to just one point, life. When you look at how things change and how we adapt to a certain degree, you know, technology in itself is mirroring the natural evolution of man. I create stories that mirror that, stuff that doesn't so much as jar with your existence, something that fits in, you know, um, I love the way people, ed I mean, editors, and I know a few of you here, when you, you take a film script and you, you, know, you have flashbacks and you have all the rest of the stuff, it's beautiful. Nonetheless, when I create films or my, my process, I put in the opportunity for maybe within the cinematic context, the audience get to experience the flashback as well. You know, life evolves, it moves on, and stories to a certain degree are meant to do that. And I had, a, I had a little quote here that's like, you know, life or making film is very, very similar to, to when Michael Jackson sang the song, We Are the World. Well, in true honesty, when you, when you, when you look at how stories are, well, all the stuff I do is packaged and, and produced and presented, to a certain point, I have no control over what I do because I've handed a lot of that control over to the public. And if you were to have a man, money man sitting right in front of me here and give him the options of spending about three quarters of a million pounds on marketing or spending about 50 grand seeding a story that the public can be involved in from the very start so that when you finally hit the cinema or you hit the screen, you already have the best part of two, three million people who know the story by heart, who've been part of the story, who are eager to sit down and see what it is. That 
is the core essence of transmedia. I say transmedia is life, like the evolution. From ape, <laughs> going to sit in front of a computer. <laughs> um, I kind of find it quite farcical to a certain degree when people get, um, and I know cinema making, filmmaking is very serious business. Um, but every once in a while, the business part of it obscures the fun that you should really have when you're making films. And that is what make-believe is. The sheer escapism that you afford yourself and you afford your audience to actually get into the core essence of the story you're trying to tell. So for me, my approach to storytelling is it's intuitive, it has to be instinctive, it has to be adventurous and it has to be entertaining. If you're asking people to take their time or take time away from their normal lives and immerse themselves in some make-believe, You've got to reward them somewhat. You've got to take them away from the tedium of modern day life. And trust me, life can be absolutely boring as hell. Um, the use of mediums to tell a story, as, uh, as our dear Helen explained earlier on. Um, you know, cross media, and this is where I kind of split. And I, as I say, I'm just going through a bit of process. Cross media, beautiful. You take content, the same thing, you map it, you put it on iPhone, iPad app, TV, film, book. Great. It's a money-making mechanic. It does no reward whatsoever for the creative flow. Whereas transmedia, the fact that you're taking various aspects of a story and you're putting it in places that people can interact with it, in ways that it mirrors their day-to-day -day existence, their daily routine, their daily lives. In other words, there's stuff that they can listen to, part of the story that they can interact with, through a podcast, which is released at about 8 o'clock in the morning as the way as people are going to work. And by midday, when they're about to hit the lunch, the second part of the story unfolds, be it online, because at that point, they're either getting ready to go for lunch, you know, and later on in that evening, they then realize that, hey, if you go to this cafe, you'll actually interact with another part of the story as people are there to entertain you. So you actually start to take time and adjust and it becomes an entertaining, intuitive sort of concept. And that I find more exciting a way of packaging and doing what I do. Now, one of the other key core elements is how the power shifts from you, the audience, to the producer. Now, the way I do things is quite unique because you start out as a member of the audience. You're intrigued, you're excited. This is really interesting stuff. And then you become a participant because I've opened the door for you to step in and actually take control of certain things. But then each individual is unique. You have your own respective national characteristics, your background, where you grew up, whether you're a single child, whether you're affluent. All these manner of things come to play. And at some point, as a producer or a creator, I lose control over what I'm creating, mainly because you have started adding your own respective influence. Thus, you more or less become the producer, and the producer if they're worth their weight in gold, becomes a participant because the producer should never become a member of the audience. Thus, you end up playing catch up with the story as it's been produced and co-created alongside the audience who were once, oh, well, the participants or the producers who were once members of the audience. And these are some of the things that I, I put up. The sheer fact that you've, you've got your own imagination, your own influences, society that you come from, you know, what part of the audience, time, all these, relevant, all these are very re relevant to, to how um, a story unfolds. And the basic adage that, you know, build with where people are in the, in the storytelling world, and I, I hope I'm not preaching the, to the converted here, I hope you do understand where I'm going. The sheer fact that people say build and they will come is so year 2000, Everybody, everybody knows they're already here. They are waiting for you to step up with whatever you have. It is no longer, you cannot second guess the audience in any way. They are eager, you know. 
a lot of them are willing to break away from the tedium of their lives. They want to get in. They want to get involved. And all you have to do is prod them. A lot of projects come up these days where you, you build an alternate reality game or a marketing campaign around a concept, you know, and it just becomes a gimmick of getting people into the cinema. I have engaged in that. I have produced enough of those. I've won awards for some of them. But I kind of feel they shortchange the audience because you're just you're giving them a little, you know, little tinkering of, of what could possibly be. Whereas if you open the door fully and you actually let them in, then you're engaging them. And then they're adding a lot of collateral to what you're creating. With that said, I would like to introduce you to my new project. Um, it's called Clockwork Watch. It's a steampunk story, and steampunk is Victoriana. It's sci-fi, set in 1891. And it's a love story um, based around a man who will do anything to be with the woman he loves. The story is told, as mentioned, in several parts. Um, the first stage is world building. World building is where I've opened the door for the, the audience to step in and help create the universe that um, the story is going to be told in. And that we are doing right now. Um, to set the scene, um, it's set in England. Britain is in recession, as we are right now. It's no different. Um, Queen Victoria is still alive. And she asks a team of scientists to think the unthinkable, to create something, to put great back into Great Britain. And they, in turn, because of the technology of the age, everything's powered by steam and mechanics. They create the first robot, the first sentient automaton. <laughs> but they found it very, very hard to power that automaton. They couldn't work out how to do it. And then they found out that there was an Indian scientist who lives in Calcutta who has mastered kinetic engineering. And please, don't question the science. The science does not work. I know it's make-believe. And he finds a way of using kinetic energy based on a gyroscope to keep the robots working continuously. And he says, as long as they move, they're powering themselves. So that is part one. The second part is based on that dog, um, this man, this scientist's relationship with his son. Um, and that, to a certain degree, has a reflection on my life and my relationship with my dad, because it fell, it fell apart horribly. And I kind of tapped into that, because I wanted a lot of conflict. I wanted that angst when the son, at certain part of the drama, decides, and this will, I didn't do this, by the way, I amplified it somewhat, where the son makes it his lifelong ambition to destroy everything his dad has lived for. The, four, the third and the fourth part, and this is stuff that we're co-creating with the world, and this is where, as a creator, I get extremely excited, and you see me jumping around when, when I get to this stage. Because the first and the second stage of the project are scene setting. They are the bits that we set up with the world, with our co-creators, as in the audience. The third and the fourth part are when we introduce the two characters who fall in love. Don't forget, this is a five-year-long project. The love affair is not going to materialize until around 2014. The public don't even know about it. The people who funded us don't know about it. It is just a secondary thing. The script is written and locked down. But in true me fashion, the world and the conditions that forbid that love affair are going to be dictated by the public who are interacting with the story right now. So I am setting up a series of hurdles, questions, um, tasks that the public are reporting back on on a weekly basis online. And that is going to make a very tight world which dictates how these guys fall in love, things they can and can't do within this narrative. Thus, you have a tight film with a lot of co-creation and a lot of creative sort of tinkering by the public who have supported the project and helped tell the story and contributed their own stories over a three-year period. 
Clockwork Watch is told through three graphic novels. I've got a, I brought some down. I should have actually brought more. Um, but I'll get into the graphic novel a little bit later on. It's a beautiful piece of hand-drawn um, um, art. Um, so it's told through three graphic novels, an online world, live events. We're holding three this year, two theater performances, pop-up shops, a feature film, an interactive book, an anthology of stories written by the public that we are going to publish, and we are donating all the proceeds to a charity dictated by our Facebook group. And then each contributor can amplify and take their own unique story and build on it free of charge, because it's theirs. So they can use our platform and our story and our whole project to launch their careers if they so want to be writers, authors, or whatever they want to do. We started um, last year through crowdfunding, and I went a, a different route. Um, I went to Indiegogo, because um, I, I knew the guy, I know the guy who runs it. I met him at a festival in, in London some time ago. And we wanted to do something a little bit different, um, as everyone does, I guess. We looked at crowdfunding, and what sort of perk could we give? What would give us the legacy that we really required? we could offer people as we did. You get a signed copy of the graphic novel, you get a poster, you get a piece of original art. But that still didn't fulfill my main objective of getting people to tell stories. So we set a threshold and told people that, look, um, if you fund up to a certain level, send in a photograph. We'll draw you into the story as a character, which was great. I mean, the reason for me to do crowdfunding was one, it wasn't the money, the money was important. I am broke, I'm flat broke, I have no money, I spent all my money making the first film and then this one. But it was to introduce the project, to get support from people, to get a buy-in. We wanted them to embrace and really get into the story. To start telling the story itself and more importantly to find our audience. The moment someone gives you money to do something, they'll always remember you. And as a matter of fact, if it's something that they love, they'll share it with other friends. And that's one of the beauties of, of crowdfunding. The money for us was secondary. OK, I could have found a few friends to give us. We only raised 10 grand, um, $10,000, which is about 6,500 pounds. But it was really important that I connected with the people who I wanted to help me tell this story. And that was the fundamental reason for doing this. We. Um, managed the campaign so well that we were awarded the best Indiegogo campaign, um, comic campaign for 2011, which really excited us. And I, as you pointed out, Helen, this was the most harrowing experience of my life. Raising money from friends and family is nothing compared to this, because you then start running into people's personal stories. Things like a friend who, who phoned me up and said, I really want to give you some money, but I am broke. And it is a choice. The choice I have in front of me now is I either give you some money, I buy Christmas presents for my daughters, or I get to spend Christmas with my daughter. And that was it. He had a choice. And I just phoned him up and said, dude, it's fine. The sheer fact that you've offered me that, that support in itself is enough. So telling the story. As I said, it's make-believe, and this is where I'm going to start getting a little bit deep. And if you have any questions, this may be a good time to kind of remember them and jot them down, because I'm going to be on a flow. Um, the main thing we wanted to do was start a Victorian narrative in a modern world. And finding Victorian places in London are pretty impossible. So we set up a fictional government department called the Department for Advancement of Sciences. And that was the department that our Indian scientist worked for. And on the 6th of May, we opened shop. We opened shop with a, an event called Tomorrow's World Today. We made sure that all the performers that we had there were from the genre that we were trying to deal with, all steampunk, sci-fi, Victoriana people. We chose a location which is underneath one of the oldest bridges or train stations in London, London Bridge. And you had a tunnel that hadn't been used since 1954. We cleaned it out and we created a Victorian street market. When people stepped in, we told them, we said, come on, come, come. This is an opportunity for you to interact with a story. What they didn't realize was they were the actors. They were the story. 
Now, we had 250 people. They all came dressed up. Every single one of them came themed. What was kind of unusual was we thought we were going to have a drop-off. Every single person bought a ticket, apart from our funders, who we invited. Now, they stepped into this space, and we thought, it's not going to work. We'll just about do well. We had, a mass, we had one big corner that we, with a banner that said lost and confused. As people walked in, they went there and they were given task cards, things for them to do. They stayed for nine hours in a dark, dingy, damp, dim lit sort of place interacting with the story. They wanted to know more. They wanted to know, they'd read between the lines, they wanted to know where this robot was going to be, when it was going to be developed and all the rest. And we gave them an opportunity to actually experience part of the narrative. We had stage shows. We, we borrowed um, a, couple of, um, <laughs> a, a couple of styles from Apple, where we said, we haven't quite created the robots yet, but we're going to bring out the various parts. And we hired someone to create about three parts for us. So after the first presentation, they said, and this is the department that have created the arm. And they came out with this mechanical arm, and they showed you how it worked and all the rest. And it went down really, really well. As I said, everyone dressed up. Now, one of the key things is we want the public to tell the story. Other people would have filmed this event. We didn't. We made a point of having no cameras there whatsoever. But about five, six days after, I found this online. Someone had sneaked in a camera, filmed it, posted it. Into the mechanical device, we have actually been able to, through the use of, of pistons and hydraulic fluids, been actually able to extend the thinking of the nerve ending. We even found um, the we even found the only the only um, Victorian rapper, <laughs> Professor Elemental. But then another thing happened that was really unusual, because one of the characters walked in and started handing out flyers. Now, we had said we were creating automatons. We hadn't said any. We told people that there were various factions of this universe. But we hadn't really gone into much detail. Then someone turns up and says, if you're creating robots, then there have to be workers creating those robots. And from day one, someone came in and said, I'm a trade unionist. And this is my leaflet called the Spanner. And I think you're exploiting the workers. And basically took up shop and started campaigning there and then. And I thought, that is brilliant. That is all I really want. I want people to turn up and help create the universe that the story is being told within. We give them the freedom to do that. He owns his character. He owns the publication. He owns his website. He owns his story. He could create, I mean, it's a five-year-long thing. Within that space, he can do anything with the spanner. And he did. So what was very also kind of exciting about this was the fact that people engaged with the narrative over the nine-hour period, and they didn't know where it was going. They had no idea whatsoever. 
And at the very end, we pulled out a table, and then we started selling copies of this. And the first three people to buy copies came running back and said, I can't believe it. I said, why? I said, you see that lady over there? She's mirrored on the lady over there. And she'd been interacting with this woman. She'd been with this woman for about an hour and a half because she was an emissary from Queen Victoria. Then found out that that character is one of the central roles in this. And then found out that a lot of the stuff that she'd been telling her and a lot of the questions she was asked are relevant to what's in the graphic novel. I said, you've expanded this whole thing. I said, of course we have. And then some of the characters who were, who were there, one of their tasks was, look, the journalist who was meant to be covering this story has been kicked out. Kindly write a report and post it on a website. <laughs> then behold, they started telling stories. Each came with their own respective narrative and started to tell us what they had seen on the day. Thus, we create another form of user-generated content using a website. Now, I will say, this project has no Twitter streams. It has no Facebook pages. It is Victorian England. We are not asking people to use technology. We're asking them to use their interpersonal rela re relations with other people, interactions with other people, to help tell the story. And that is one of the central tenets of Clockwork Watch. I have banned all technology altogether. I want people to tell stories. And that is all it is. And then, out of the blue, I get a phone call from a festival called Latitude. Latitude um, boasts about 35 to 40,000 people. So we like what you're doing. We, we heard about that Victorian thing that you did. We want you to come and do it for us. And I said, well, yeah, but we can't. What do you mean you can't? Well, this isn't a performance that goes on and on. This is a story that is being told. The bit that you're interested in happened about three months ago. Currently, the trade unionists, as um, shepherded by my colleague, are out on strike. They have said the clockworks robots that they're creating at some point will be taking their jobs. So they've called a nationwide strike and they're out. And um, the lady said, oh my god, that's amazing. I said, how? She said, well, the day that we want you to come and do your performance is Bastille Day. It works perfectly. Bring your trade unionists, bring your scientists, and come and fuck about with our people. So I said, awesome. So, <laughs> so we expanded the narrative. We got a bunch of actors together, went to the costume department, got costumes, made banners, made flyers, bought a whole load of science, Victorian scientific gear, set up a full-blown lab, saying that the advancement of sciences were taking their roadshow out to show people, you know, Look at the robots we're creating. They're for your better. They will change your world. It's the way to go. And then right in front of the, the, the nice little lab and the hut that we had, we put the trade unionists. So if you wanted to see what these guys had created, you had to go across a picket line of, of striking trade unionists. And that created a whole load of drama. We also took the opportunity of inviting all the people who had become trade unionists and were very active, and we invited them into the space. Come and act your story. Come and be part of this thing as it develops. And we shot this. This may be a bit loud. No, we're gonna go back, let's see. Okay. Are you going to play? No. Stop the clock! 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 Stop the Stop the clock! Stop the clock! 
Stop the clock! Stop the clock! Stop the clock! Stop the clock! Stop the clock! Stop the clock! Stop the clock! Oh, good afternoon. Hello, yes. My name is Professor Cicadius Cartwright. Welcome. I am one of the great illustrious members of the Department of the Advancement of Sciences. Welcome. I imagine you've come here for the exhibition. Now, I am going to introduce you to the wonderful world of Bors Hobbiton and how we, yes, we are all going to benefit from the advancement of sciences and how we can make an automaton. Now, here we actually have the working and first prototype of the heart. Now, I know you read in the newspapers recently about the awful shame that uh, Professor von Klink in Germany and uh, Alexander Taylor had. Now, this working item is actually going to go into our, one of our main primary parts devices of the automaton. Now, the automaton is going to be a working device for every home. Of course, there is uh, main concerns regarding the cost of it, but we are working with that. Now here we actually have the actual thought process. Now if we examine this and actually apply a chemical that has been recently researched, you will actually discover that the main benefit is the fact that cognitive processes, looking at the main idea that the formulation of the differentiation of 26 parts to one part will actually give us six cognitive thoughts per millisecond. Now that, following along, with our ideas mean that clockwork machines will be available in every home very shortly. Please ignore all the protests that you are hearing outside that we are trying to take jobs. That is completely false. Ultimately, we will need more workers to make our wonderful automatons, won't we? Now, please come back more now. If you need to catch hold of me, I'm Circadius Cartwright. You can find me at clockworkswatch.com and ultimately, with our hearts and our minds together, we will be able to move forward into the 20th century. So, advancement of science is some clandestine, weird bunch of crazy scientists creating automatons around the world and trying to change the labor force in the UK. Now, as the story developed, we had to add a certain amount of conflict. So advancement of sciences was shut down by the Queen because all the workers were out on strike. But what we then did was expanded the story a little bit further by taking it elsewhere. A week ago, we published this, which was our news release from the London Gazette, which explained that advancement of sciences hadn't just been closed down, but they had run our way out of the country and released these documents. Now, what a lot of people don't quite work out or haven't quite worked out is these documents are the key to another tier of the story that we hope the alternate reality game people are going to get into. And it gets a little bit deep, but if you're writing something for five years, you have to make it engaging. This is a key to another part of the narrative which is going to take another three, four months to tell with a whole load of online content that we're expecting people to find at some point. When you create your own things, as we do, and you try pushing the boundaries on what you have done, it opens up new opportunities and new, new sort of bits of fun to engage with. And one, one such thing is laser lace. Now, we asked people to come and help tell these stories. We have given them creative control over what they do. They own their stories. After a while, we were approached by someone who said, I would like to create a story, but my story has got a commercial element to it. I would like to create something that has a, its own Kickstarter campaign, its own shop, and its own revenue stream. And I said, well, hey, it's your story. So Laser Lace is a series of stories released backing up a beautiful, ornate business plan that someone has put together. We have no control over it whatsoever. It has launched, and it's going to be running concurrently through our narrative. Thus, we're giving people the opportunity to actually make money out of something that we have no control over. And then it brings us to the next part of the narrative. Now, with advancement of sciences being shut down, we, they had to go somewhere, which posed a problem for us. 
The solution came in the fact that more than 70% of our funding came from outside the UK. And I thought, well, we promised everyone an opportunity to interact with this because it's a very big experiential concept. It is not just graphic novel. It is not just live. It's not this or that. So we have moved the story over to Vancouver, where it's going to be unfolding in the next two months. And we're going to be hosting live events there and interacting with the audience and bring a new part of the story to the table. And that's all going to be done through the second graphic novel, which is where the boy grows up and he goes on a, on a mentalist sort of adventure trying to destroy everything that his dad has created. Within the narrative, because we're doing our own costumes and our own props and all the rest of the stuff, and we know the audience that we're trying to engage with, the sheer fact that people buy their own clothes, they make their own clothes. We've built in revenue streams as pop-up shops. We're doing a clothing range where we're going to be designing our own clothes and selling them to the public. And it's almost on a par with trying to create the Rocky Horror Show, but to do it for Victorian times. And that is our main objective. The third graphic novel, Countenance, is being released in 2013. We've already started working on that. Don't know how we're going to pay for it, how we're going to produce it, but um, the work has already begun. We don't even know how we're going to pay for Breakaway, but that will come. And everything we have done to date has been done on £6,500, which is... <laughs> ten. But then there's more. We found a partner who has budgeted, who says um, the film will probably cost about £5 million to make, and they're looking into raising the money for us. As I promised, and I have promised, and I, I remain fairly resolute, the universe is being created by, or co-created by the public. And one of the beauties of this is, you can't change a film script from the background. And as the background is being created, whoever jumps into bed with us to make the film will have to acknowledge the will of our co-creators. Thus, they have a say in how the film is made. Then there's more. This man falls in love with a clockwork servant. As I said, man falls in love with woman in a world where such love is forbidden. He falls in love with a clockwork automaton. And the beauty about that is she's new, she's young, she's never experienced love before. And as we go through the narrative, she's almost like a constant observer of the world around her, but she keeps a diary. That diary is being written by a fairly well-known novelist, and it will be made available online at some point. And we hope it's a catalyst that will send people back to watch the film after they have learnt her inner thoughts, to go and reflect on what they have seen and make it almost cyclical sort of concept where you watch the film and say, yeah, she was actually quite nice, but what was she actually thinking at that point? And that's how we're going to unfold another inner layer. Um, and at the end of the film, the characters, the main characters disappear. But they then, and that is the only time that we're going to tap into digital. At the very end, you will be able to interact with the characters, the main characters, online through an almost World of Warcraft-like environment. And that is how we want to take all the people who have co-created the world with us and bring them into a space where they can interact with the world one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be um, glad to answer. And I've also got a copy, of, a few copies of some of the stuff that we did that I can show you. Since we have, um, since we have a lot of time, um, I did, we can... I did rush through. I'm sorry. I, I, got a, <laughs> no I, got a, I got a little bit nervous, and I thought you'd cut me short halfway through. So I. No, I you had like easily about 20 minutes um, more. I can talk more. <laughs> but um, if you have any questions or. Um, you want to approach Yomi, you can, we have easily 20 minutes before the lunch, so you can do it here. Um, if you'd rather do it in a more private setting, we can move it to the, okay, there's one question. How many co-producers do you have? Um, none. <laughs> um, I, wor I work with a very tight team. I have an illustrator. I have someone who has adapted all of my scripts. 
Um, I have one person who has helped to manage my live events, but all the creative has been done by me, um, and all the £6,500 has gone to pay the people who helped develop the graphic novel. Any other questions? I mean, check it out online. Um, it's there. Uh, one of the unique things is, unlike this whole idea of premium content and all the rest, we have no control over the story as it's being told, so people are uploading, and the object of the exercise is you can hit this story at any point and read the whole lot. You can interact with the people who are co-writing the story at any point and interact with them. So it is out there, and I believe we will hopefully make a little bit of money when we make the film or when we do the alternate reality sort of stuff or the, the, the World of Warcraft part. But um, we just want to do something that people can use to tell stories.